Rebecca Schaefer isn't a household name, but she could have been. An actress who was on the cusp of fame. After all, she was auditioning for The Godfather Part 3. She was breaking away from television and onto the big screen, but a stalker took her life. By finding her address with the help of a private investigator, showing up to her house, ringing the doorbell, and shooting her. In the next two weeks, I'm going to talk about stalkers, Robert John Bardo, and then next week, Ricardo Lopez. Ricardo's story is for another time. Right now, let's look at an obsessive human being who murdered a budding star in the front door of her apartment. November 6, 1967, in Eugene, Oregon. Dana and Dr. Benson Schaefer welcomed into this world a baby girl named Rebecca. Dana was a writer and instructor for Portland Community College, and Dr. Benson Schaefer was a child psychologist. We were very lucky as a family. Each of us had a very close relationship with Rebecca. This is a picture of me holding Rebecca when she was probably three to four months old. And uh, what can I say? I adored her. Rebecca first wanted to be a rabbi as her family was Jewish, but she began modeling when she was in high school. When she was 16, she decided to begin a career in modeling. She up and moved from Portland, Oregon, to New York City. While she was in New York, she lived with an actress who had become one of her closest friends, Barbara Lush. Also because of her height, she was deemed too short for modeling, even though she was five foot seven. But while she was in New York City, she attended the Professional Children's School, a school that pretty much was for aspiring child actors and dancers. She even landed a short time role on One Life to Live, which was a soap opera in the 1980s. It's not like we know each other real well or anything. Annie, I mean, come on, would you get yourself together? I mean, aren't you liberated or anything? Liberated enough to tell you where you can get off, buddy! I thought I had friends here. You do have friends here, Annie. No, I don't. It's only on the surface, Dan. In 1985, still wanting to become a model, she moved to Japan where she felt it would be easier for her to get work. But there, she still found difficulty finding work because of her height, but also her weight. Remember, this was the 1980s, where you had to be skinny as a twig and tall in order to make it as a model. And this is why a lot of aspiring models developed eating disorders. Either way, she decided to return to New York City, this time not as a model, but as an actress. Acting and getting roles is not easy. There are a lot of people in auditions and you have to stand out. She did get a small role in a Woody Allen film called Radio Days, but she was cut from it. To make do until she landed big roles, she modeled a little and worked as a waitress. One of these modeling gigs she got was on the cover of Seventeen magazine where she caught the eye of producers. She would be cast as Patty Russell on a short-lived sitcom called My Sister Sam. With that role, she moved to Los Angeles. Hi, I'm Patty Russell, and this is my sister Sam. I just moved in. We haven't lived together since we were kids. I was raised by our aunt and uncle. Yeah, things sure have changed. I used to dress her. I can't wear this out in public. This makes up for the haircut you gave me when I was three. My Sister Sam ran on CBS from October 6, 1986 to April 12, 1988. The premise of the sitcom follows two sisters, 29-year-old Sam, played by Pam Dauber, and her sister Patty, played by Rebecca. Well, I kind of get a kick out of having my kid sister live with me. I mean, of course, it has its disadvantage. Curfew. Yeah, but it's, it's energizing having someone live with you who has big dreams. Rock stuff. What happened to Senator? That was last week. Dreams, that's what it's all about. <laughs> Can I get my nose pierced? Dream on, kid. Around this time, Pam Dauber was hot. She had just got off working opposite Robin Williams and Mork and Mindy. My sister Sam took place in San Francisco. Sam is a freelance photographer whose parents died years ago. 
Patty shows up, who had been living with their aunt and uncle in Oregon, to let Sam know she was going to live with them. So straightforward plot. Hijinks ensue because of a teenage girl. In real life, Pam Dauber and Rebecca Schaefer got along so well, Rebecca actually was living with Pam when she first moved to L.A. In fact, when Rebecca ended up making enough to get her own apartment, Pam gave her a piece of advice. When it comes to being a celebrity, never put your name on your mailbox. We will get to that stuff later in the video, but I felt it important to highlight it here. At first, the show did well. Its first season was highly watched, and Rebecca Schaefer was everywhere. CBS Morning Show, TV Guide, Seventeen Magazine, parade coverages. She worked her ass off to make sure her name was out there, but also promote the show she was on. But the second season was less successful. This was due to moving time slots, which can cause the death of any show in the 80s. So the show was canceled before all the episodes of the second season were aired, but not before an incident of note happened. A man began writing Rebecca incessantly. She even sent him a postcard back. You see, Rebecca loved to respond to fan mail, even when others told her it was a bad idea. But Rebecca never saw herself as famous or a celebrity. She saw everyone who supported her as friends. This can be a double-edged sword. She wrote back to this man, Your letter was the nicest one I got. In some ways, it makes you more down-to-earth and willing to talk to someone. But it can also lead to bad things. In that postcard, she was polite and cordial to the man writing her, thanking him for the support he showed and signing the front with an autograph. But he mistook this kindness as an invitation to try to meet her. He showed up at the Warner Brothers set to try to get in, carrying flowers and a teddy bear. The man claimed to know her, so security called Rebecca's trailer. She told them she did not know him. Security turned him away and notified Rebecca and staff on set. He attempted to again, this time armed with a knife he would again be ran off the set. This is important because the man who did all of this was Robert John Bardo, and he didn't take the hint to leave her alone. Robert John Bardo. Here's a picture of him when he was roughly 19. Dude looks like he's in his late 20s at the most. Born January 2nd, 1970, he was the youngest child of June and Philip Bardo, and he did not have the best of childhoods. In stark contrast to Rebecca Schaefer's childhood, Bardo was abused by his older brother and neglected. His father was an alcoholic. His mother was completely insane. And because of all of this, he was placed in foster care. It was also because he threatened to commit self-deletion. He became heavily obsessed with one of his teachers in school, which wasn't going to be the last of his obsessive tendencies. But before we get to that, I also want to point out that he was arrested three times, including charges of DV and disorderly conduct. He also had a habit of freaking out his neighbors, and one teacher called him a time bomb waiting to explode. So before 1985, he stalked a child peace activist named Samantha Smith, I say before because in 1985, Samantha Smith died in a plane crash at age 13. Bardo was 15, by the way. He ended up working a dead-end job at a jack-in-the-box as a janitor. And one night, he saw a commercial for My Sister Sam and became obsessed with Rebecca Schaefer. So he ended up plastering his walls with her pictures and sending letters like I mentioned. When she wrote back to him, it made him feel like there was a connection. So he flew to LA from Tucson, Arizona. And like I said, he tried to get on the Warner Brothers lot twice which is the 80s equivalent of creepily sliding into somebody's DMs. The first time, he was rejected and angered. But the second time, he seemed to have gotten the hint because he backed off a lot. And instead, he got really obsessive over Debbie Gibson, Madonna, and Tiffany. He also really loved a U2 song called Exit, which they played in his trial, and this happened. Until this point in the trial, the defendant had remained composed in the courtroom. But once the song Exit was played, he sang and strummed to the music. Yeah, just lost control of himself there. In 1989, though, he would return to his obsession with Rebecca Schaefer, all because she appeared in a black comedy called Scenes from the Class Struggle in Beverly Hills. In that movie, she has a sex scene. And, well, that pissed him off. Watching your mom's Hillary pilot. It's just what Moe sent me to get. Wait, don't take that. I'm not done. <laughs> you are now. I know what you were doing. 
You're gonna grow hair on your palms and go blind. Steroids are gonna do that anyway. Willie, you need to get a girlfriend before you turn into a pervert. You mean like Frank? To him, she was no longer innocent. He was jealous and he called her a Hollywood whore. And then he found a copy of People magazine that featured an article about the stalking case of Teresa Saldana. There they outlined how Saldana's stalker, Arthur Richard Jackson, used a private investigator to track Saldana down. When Jackson found where Saldana lived, he ended up going there and stabbing her. Saldana lived through it. But the article gave Bardo the same idea. So he hired a private investigator to find Rebecca Schaefer which the PA found through the Department of Motor Vehicles in LA. And once he had her address, he returned to LA, this time with a Ruger GP100 handgun and a copy of the book, The Catcher and the Rye. July 18th, 1989. Bardo roamed through the neighborhood that Rebecca Schaefer lived at, talking to her neighbors to try to figure out if that was the apartment she lived in. When he was sure, he rang her doorbell. Rebecca at the time was expecting a script for The Godfather Part 3. She was going to audition for a role in the movie, so she answered the door expecting that. Instead, she came face to face with Bardo, who showed her the card that she had sent him calling himself her biggest fan. She must have been freaking out on the inside, but on the outside, she just smiled and nodded to him and asked him politely to never come back. He left, went and ate at a local diner, but he decided to return because according to him, he wanted to give her a CD and a letter. When she answered the second time, she wasn't in a good mood. She coldly said, according to Bardo, you came to my door again. This statement left him feeling like she didn't care, so he pulled out his handgun and fired. She was hit in the chest at point blank. According to Bardo, her last words were why. Bardo fled the scene, throwing his copy of The Catcher in the Rye onto the roof. Neighbors hearing the commotion came out and found her laying in her own doorway. She was rushed to Cedar sinai Medical Center, where she was pronounced dead. Bardo returned to Tucson, where he was found the next day wandering Interstate 10. Once in police custody, he immediately confessed to the murder. That confession tape was shown in his trial, which was recorded on camera. Before I get into the trial, I think it would be good to show this guy's reaction to that day. And then I look, I see him, I'm down the hallway. I'm through. I was like, I saw that was there, and I was like, you know, it's like, there she is, and I don't have to shoot any security guards get her and she's right there in front of me, you know? And I there's no big security guards and all she wasn't dressed up glamorously like some And I you know I was just you know, I was just just like this, just me and her, you know. I grabbed it with this hand I grabbed the door. Got him still in the bed. Moves around, grab grab on the chair. This Bardo comes off to me like he is so excited that he did what he did, taking the life of another person. You can hear it in his tone and the way he stumbles over what he wants to say. He is excited about what he did. Yeah, he confessed to it and there was a trial. Why was there a trial? Because he pleaded not guilty. His lawyers reasoned that he was not mentally well enough to know what he was doing. They stated he was allegedly diagnosed with schizophrenia, which doesn't mean he did not know what he was doing. The prosecutor in the case was Marsha Clark, who would go on to be the prosecutor for the O.J. Simpson trial. I'm going to play snippets of the trial, but not too long. And I felt that I'd accomplished something by getting this fellow to agree to leave town. So you felt that you had gotten him straightened away and he wasn't going to come back? Yes. He asked for Rebecca. I told him she wasn't there. He left a number for her to return a call. He then called again at 11.05 and professed that he was a very good friend of hers and it was urgent that I get this message to her. I then called the number that he left and there was no such person there. However, I thought I had better tell Rebecca. I called Rebecca at 11.34 uh, and told her about the calls and she said, I don't know anybody by that name and there was nothing, I take it, in his behavior that caused you to have any concern about uh, giving him the information he was requesting? No, there wasn't. I have nothing further. Did you become aware at some point that your brother was interested in the actress starring in My Sister Sam? Yes, I did. 
about a month before, or excuse me, I'm sorry, about two months before the murder occurred, did you see him looking through the yellow pages to locate a private detective? I believe I did. And about a month before the murder occurred, did the defendant tell you that he had in fact hired a private detective to find Rebecca Schaefer? I believe he did. And did he tell you that he had paid a few hundred dollars for that service? I believe so. Were you aware that he had, the defendant had gone to Los Angeles several times before to see celebrities? Yes, I was. Had he ever indicated to you a desire to take the gun to Los Angeles on previous occasions? He gave some indications that I inferred suggested that. So, I mean, in a roundabout way, yes, he did. This was a bench trial, which is not a jury trial. In a bench trial, the judge decides the verdict. Bardo waived his right to a jury trial if they took the death penalty off the table. And in the 1980s, California still had the death penalty. He was found guilty of first-degree murder. He is still in prison to this day. And he has written to those who write to him. I'm going to play a snippet of what one person who got a letter from him has to say. Clearly Robert admits fault here, and his words state that he's aware of the effects of his actions. But the details he chooses to include, such as her parents' location and the location of Rebecca's grave, suggest to me that he still has obsessive tendencies. I left this out until the end, but Rebecca met a man she was dating at the time of her death. His name was Brad Sieberling. Brad was a director who would go on to direct Casper, City of Angels, and Lemony Snicket's A Series of Unfortunate Events. But one of his films was more personal, Moonlight Mile. This film was loosely inspired by Sieberling's own experience with what happened with Rebecca. The story follows a man whose fiance had been murdered and how he deals with his grief. This also led Congress to enact the Driver's Privacy Protection Act, which prohibits the DMV from disclosing addresses of people. It also led to a lot of anti-stalking laws to be passed around the country in order to make sure that something like this never happens again. Bardo was disturbed. But next week in this two-parter, I'm going to go over a man who was a lot more disturbed. A man who plotted to kill the Icelandic singer Bjork and videotaped himself covered in paint, acting strange, and then self-deleting. His name was Ricardo Lopez. Till then. <laughs>